saying my team now represents multiple whistleblowers in connection to that August 12th disclosure. The lawyers say no further comment at this time, but the information we're hearing is that this new whistleblower does have first-hand knowledge that supports the claims made by the initial whistleblower. So it's a lot to keep up with, but the reports are, and the confirmation, uh, first reported by ABC this morning, is that a second whistleblower is now involved. Now, my take on this is that this is another sign that the legal whistleblower process is working. Checks and balances are working. You know, look, I was going to start the show today by bemoaning just how dark these days are. A president blowing his top, asking foreign governments to find dirt on his opponents, accusing lawmakers of treason, calling the press corrupt. Chuck Todd was right. This national nightmare is upon us. And frankly, it's going to get worse before it gets better. But I think there are reasons to be optimistic right now. I think the ugly truth is coming out. Congress is getting to the bottom of it. And the nation's leading news outlets are leading the way, blowing this scandal wide open, explaining how Trump is abusing his power, decoding it to the text messages and the other evidence that's coming out, interviewing sources from D.C. all the way to Ukraine, and showing how all of the evidence in the words of the Washington Post front page story today, how all the growing evidence buttresses the report from the original whistleblower complaint. Reporters are asking the right questions, in some cases prompting Trump to admit to misconduct right there on live TV. And reporters are digging up more information, uh, like this, uh, from the Washington Post this weekend. Uh, it's a different headline. It says, Trump's calls with foreign leaders have long worried aides. Some of those aides are, quote, genuinely horrified by the conduct on these calls with world leaders. Now I read that and I wonder, when were they gonna tell us? But here's the point. The process is working. Inch by inch, one story at a time, we are finding out more. So right now I see big, uh, three big challenges for the press and the public. First, keeping up with the torrent of news. I think daily explainers, stories like this, here's the latest, newsletters, all of that is helping us keep up. Number two, keeping an open mind. Let's not assume that we know what is going to happen here. Nobody knows how this is going to end. And I think the third challenge for the press and the public is keeping an eye, a wary eye, on the disinformation campaigns that are going on without getting suckered by it. Right now, Trump is protected by his Fox News fan club, by a force field of falsehood that is excusing his behavior and claiming that the deep state is out to get him. Uh, you see what he's doing on Twitter all weekend long. Right-wing media is Trump's ultimate wall. He's using that wall, tweeting out clips from his favorite Fox News shows. That's continuing at this hour. But there are a few signs of cracks in the wall. This reality distortion force field may not be working as well as it used to. So right now, let's start right there uh, with expert analysis from our guests here in New York. The New Yorker staff writer Masha Gessen is here. CNN senior media uh, reporter Oliver Darcy is here. And Juliet Huddy, a former Fox News host, who's now the co-host of Curtis and Juliet on 77 WABC Radio here in New York. Uh, thank you all for being here. Let's unpack what is going on. Oliver, what is the current right-wing media defense of Trump? Is, is it providing a firewall for the president? Sure. If you watch outlets like Fox, it's not enough really to say, Brian, that they're being dishonest. It is an inverse image of reality. And what I mean by that is if you watch Fox, it's not President Trump who has potentially abused the powers of his office. It is Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden. If you watch Fox, it's not Trump who is lying to the American people on a regular basis. He's the truth teller. If you watch Fox, it's not the uh, right-wing fever swamps who are spreading conspiracy theories. It's the mainstream media. Total inverse image of reality. Mm. And if Trump does happen to survive this deepening scandal, I think he can only credit this right-wing media machine for poisoning the public dialogue and distorting truth for millions of people to the point where people can't tell you know, what is happening, what, what is the truth, and what, what is fiction. Right, so they just throw up their hands. Right. You've been covering conservative media for years. You used to work at Glenn Beck's The Blaze website. Do you see cracks in the force field? Uh, well, certainly, I, I think the one place I'm paying attention to right now is the Drudge Report, which is headed by Matt Drudge, was very supportive of the president early on, and he seems to have completely turned on the president. And, and he has for a while been sort of the uh, assignment editor, if you will, for right-wing media. And so him potentially turning on the president is huge. Uh, the right now, his headline is, second whistleblower comes forward. Right. He's not shying away from the news the way others might be. No, he's spotlighting the news, and he's also spotlighting the commentary of some of the president's uh, the people who the president does not like, people does like Shep like. Smith, right. people like Judge Napolitano, he's spotlighting their commentary saying, 
hey, the president may have committed crimes. Mm. And, and the second person we'll talk about is Tucker Carlson has written this op-ed where he no longer says that the president's call with Ukraine is defensible. He's actually saying it's inappropriate. He's and saying that, there's no way to spin yeah, that call. There's no way to spin it. That's what he's saying. Now, uh, obviously, there's a caveat. He is in his op-ed defending the president, saying that while he may have made an inappropriate phone call. It doesn't rise to the level of impeachment. But I still think it's a bit of a retreat from this right-wing narrative, which is that uh, the president's call was perfect, that there's nothing to look at, and hey, look at Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton. This is a bit of a retreat from, uh, that mm. I think we're seeing from Tucker Carlson. It's repositioning maybe for a new uh, way to defend the president, but it's still noteworthy. Still defense, though. Right. And Juliet, you worked at Fox for many years, 18 years at Fox News and the local station. What do you see happening today? How does this look to you? Well, I think that you have to look at, at Tucker Carlson is a great example. I mean, he's getting out there and he's putting something slightly negative, but then by the same token, immediately he follows right. with, but, you know, this impeachment thing. So I think that they're just trying to play both sides. They're both kind sides. of talking out of both sides of their mouth. Mm. And that's one of the things that Fox is very effective at doing. It's kind of, it's not so much that it's particularly clever or that they're so much uh, particularly diabolical, even though some people think that they are. It's that they're doing something that we did when we were little kids, which is... Lying by omission. At least some of us did when we were L little lying kids. Lying by omission. Lying so by just omission. leaving out key details. They leave out the context. They leave out facts. Um, they spin it so that it gives just enough information, but not all of the information. But the information that it did give out, it pushes their narrative. Hmm. You, you've said that you uh, witnessed this firsthand during the Obama years. Oh yeah. Uh, when you were when you were hosting Fox and Friends weekend. Yeah. Is it worse now? Is it better? Have it's, you seen Fox change? It's so much, uh, it's so much hard, more hardcore than it was when I was there in the mid-2000s. Mm -hmm. Once uh, President Obama was elected, I definitely sensed a shift. Mm -hmm. It seemed like the, uh, what I like to call sort of the outline of the show, which is the introductions to the guests, um, the introduction to the segment, the banners that you see at the bottom of the screen. They like to, th that's very subtle, they do it very well, but those are things that they're very effective at pushing the narrative with that don't seem so blatantly obvious. For people like us who are in the industry, we know, we, we get it. But for people at home, the layperson, they might not get that. And so I think Fox has become very effective. I would sit down on the set and I would see a script for the first time in the teleprompter live on air and I'd be like... Uh, I'm not going to say Obama's the devil. You know, I have to, I have to uh, edit on the fly here, mm. exaggerating a little bit, sort of. But um, that's that's you have to kind of take what they're saying with a grain of salt because you're not getting the whole story. Uh, of course, the president is watching, watching, watching. This is what he's consuming and then spitting back out via Twitter, and that's that feedback loop that we're seeing. I wonder, Masha, as the author of books including "The Future Is History: How Totalitarianism uh, Reclaimed Russia." If what we are seeing here in the United States reminds you at all of, of state-run media in other countries, is what we're seeing something similar at this point? A bit. I mean, um, what you see in a totalitarian country, which of course this country is not and, and, uh, and, and most countries are not, but um, what you see is a forced reality. A where, forced reality. Yeah, where basically the, the subject of a totalitarian state is told, okay, you have to inhabit this reality. This is the only available reality. Um, you, what observable facts are not a part of something of, of the thing that's available to you, and that relies on state terror. What's amazing about Trump is that he has created this completely encapsulated reality without relying on state terror. Right? It's a much it's it's a much softer. Uh, right. All he does is tweets insults at Mitt Romney. Um, that's not all he does, uh, but it is a perfectly encapsulated universe. Hmm. And I think, you know, all of us are living in a state of this incredible anxiety and have been for about two and a half years, where on the, on the one hand, we have what is observable to us as fact. On the other hand, we have what is coming at us through the tweets, through Fox News, even if you're not watching it, you're sort of getting it through osmosis. And there's a kind of temptation there, right, to sort of, you could just move in. You could live in that space hmm. and be unconflicted. And I wouldn't underestimate the force of that. Let me show you what Geraldo Rivera said about this earlier in the week. He was on with Sean Hannity, basically crediting Sean Hannity with making sure Trump does not become like Nixon. Here's what he said. You know, if it wasn't your show, Sean, they would destroy him absolutely. You're the difference between uh, Donald J. Trump and Richard Nixon. Uh, in Nixon's case, if he had someone that stuck up for him, he wouldn't have been, uh, you know, uh, motivated to cover up that burglar. He would have let the oh. perpetrators Geraldo, get their I just I don't, desserts. I don't. <laughs> Juliet, is your former colleague right? Uh, I will say that um, 
Hannity is kind of the king of the lying by omission, of mm. leaving the facts out. And I think he's been very, I mean, he pretty much is the guy that has kept Trump as a hero. Um, there are people at Fox who are, are trying to do the right thing and trying to be objective and trying to tell the whole story. I don't think Hannity is one of them. Mm. All right, more with the panel. Everybody stand by. Quick break here. So much more ahead this hour, including Bible sources. I'm Brian Stelter. Words and facts still have meaning. I feel like we've got to say that these days because of the way words are being twisted and redefined. Take, for example, the word treason. Yes, it still means something, and it's not what Trump thinks it means. The Constitution says, quote, The treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. Giving them aid and comfort. So when the president says that Congressman Adam Schiff committed treason, well, that's not treason. I mean, I think it's a, it's a statement about where we are uh, in this news cycle that we now need to have U.S. Constitution graphics and quotes on screen. That's not the only word that's being manipulated. Uh, the president, of course, wanting to, to talk about maybe arresting people, quoting Fox people, talking about Civil War-like fractures. He, his fans on Fox are also using the word coup quite a bit. So let's look up the word coup, the definition of coup, a sudden violent overthrow of an existing government by a small group. Uh, typically, armed forces or police or other military elements are involved. Keep that in mind when you listen to these comments from Fox in the last 10 days. This is the arc of how the word coup is being used on air. This leak and coup campaign. Every time you hear the word impeachment, you have to substitute the word coup and the coup needs to be shut down. What you're watching uh, is a legislative coup d'etat. This is not an impeachment. This is nothing less than an attempted coup d'etat and end run around the ballot box. Where's the violent overthrow? Anyway, that's another one of those words that's being misused. Watch out for that because it goes from the right-wing fever swamps and the Internet to Fox and then to the president's Twitter feed. Now, of course, there are other words being manipulated as well. The New Yorker's Masha Gessen has pointed this out in a new column. She points out the word investigation has a meaning as well. It means to make a systematic examination of something. There are lots of headlines right now about Trump wanting investigations, wanting Ukraine and China to investigate Joe Biden. Trump's not really looking for an investigation. He's not really looking for a systemic examination. He wants dirt. He wants dirt about his political opponents. So let's talk more about that with our panel. Masha is here along with Oliver Darcy and Juliet Huddy. Masha, what compelled you to write about this? you feel like words are being twisted right now? Well, I was looking at the headlines that said Trump wanted an investigation when uh, investigation is a word that actually has something to do with the concept of truth. Right. And whereas he, I mean, I think really and truly he believes that the whole world is rotten, that if you dig into anybody, you're going to find something. Right. So investigation is just a weapon. It's a tool. It's a cudgel. Right. And so he mm. wanted that cudgel to be deployed against his opponent because he is fully convinced that investigation always works in the same way. But then, as journalists, we have a problem because, for example, when, uh, when Nancy Pelosi made her announcement about launching an impeachment qu uh, inquiry, I counted that New York Times story had the word investigation 14 times to mean entirely different things. Oh, interesting. From the impeachment uh, inquiry to the investigation that Trump wanted to launch. Mm. Right. And the problem with that is that, you know, when, when a word could mean nothing at all because it means everything then we as journalists have a problem in conveying facts to our readers. What do we have to make sure we do in this environment? We have to be incredibly intentional about using language. Mm. And sometimes that means, you know, thinking for a long time about how we're going to phrase this. You know, he wanted not an investigation. What did he want, right? Mm. Let's use the phrase he wanted to, uh, he was pressuring the Ukrainian president to dig up dirt. And just, you know, use that phrase every time, be intentional about it. I noticed another word that I think sometimes being misused, it's unsubstantiated. We say things like, uh, the president doesn't have evidence for his claims about Biden. What we really mean is he's promoting a conspiracy theory based on a bunch of lies that are being dredged up on the web. And I, and I wonder, Oliver, if news outlets are meeting the moment well enough, if, if we're just saying, well, he's... He's saying this uh, without evidence, you right. know, they need kind a, of cheat they, words. They need to drill into their audience that this stuff is untethered from reality, <laughs> that this stuff comes from the Internet fever swamps, and the president repeats it, and, and that does not make it an unsubstantiated allegation necessarily. It means it's just a distorted, uh, it, it's, it's really poison is the best way to s describe it. You know what's interesting? The White House declined all these interview requests today. They declined CNN and all the broadcast networks. No White House aides are out on television defending Trump. Unfortunately, that means, actually in a, in a good way, that means there's less disinformation. There's less <laughs> misinformation being spread to the public today 
because the White House declined to give interviews. What a sad state of affairs that the White House giving interviews means there's going to be more misinformation out in the world. Although a lot of uh, what we saw last week was a lot of these talking points really fall apart when they entered the, the real ro world, hmm. um, whereas they, they still are allowed to thrive on Fox. And, you know, you just played that clip where people were talking about coups and civil wars. It, it's really disturbing stuff. And I actually kind of wonder, uh, Lachlan Murdoch, you know, the head of Fox, how does he really look at himself in the mirror every morning knowing that that poison is his contribution to society? I, I, I honestly, I, pretty strong, I, I can't understand how he does it. I wonder if we have to go back to real basic points, including quoting the U.S. Constitution, quoting the definition of coup. If we're going to be dealing with these lies out there in the public domain, we've got to get back to basics and explain what is an impeachment process? How is it legally defined in the Constitution? Um, look, we have a minute left, and I wonder, Juliet, since you're on radio three hours a day, you're hearing from people all day long. <laughs> Are they able to keep up with any of this? Yeah. Isn't that a fundamental problem? Yeah, here? that's the thing. There, I mean, again, people who are in our business, and this is our job to know all the developments, we miss things. So I can only imagine the layperson at home who's, I mean, it's just they're being besieged by it. They're kind of like, Ugh. I mean, sometimes I feel like I have to go home after a day of covering this news you know, lay in a corner in the fetal position and rock back and forth. Like, what, what is happening here? But I will say one thing. Yeah. I think we have to put the onus also on the public because there are people out there who support Donald Trump who, I, I'll say, this is a cup. And we'll say, that is a television. Trump said, that's a television. And I'll say, I swear to you, it's a cup. And it just goes on and on and on. And then Fox uh, will repeat it. And they'll say, that's a television, <laughs> that's a, lady. That's a television. And then their yeah. new, mm. some of their news shows, while well, trying to be fair, will we'll ask the question, is this a television? <laughs> or is it a cut? Right. Some or, people say it might be a television. That is an unsubstantiated cut. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or worse right. yet, where they will say, some people say that that is an unsubstantiated claim. Right. Some people are saying. <laughs> or Democrats Many people will say. Are saying. I Democrats will say. Yeah. Yeah. I do have to admit. I do wonder if this scandal needs a name. I, I, it's not a Ukraine scandal anymore. It's certainly not a Biden scandal. That makes that makes Biden the, 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 you know, the bad guy here. Masha, d does that matter in the public discourse? Of Talking about language. Matters. Of course it matters. I mean, I think every time that Joe Biden is mentioned, every time that Ukraine, in fact, is mentioned, that is, in a sense, misleading. We're talking about the conduct of the president of the United States and not about Ukraine. It's abuse of power gate, but I don't think we should use gate anymore. It's Trump been a stock. few decades. Trump what? Trump stock. <laughs> like Woodstock, you mean? Yeah. Stupid Watergate is a pretty good name. <laughs> Stupid Watergate. I do see that on Twitter a lot. Stupid Watergate. Uh, because some of this is being admitted to. There's surface that we only find out about later. This is certainly true with the Ukraine story. It's actually true with a lot of the bombshells about Trump. Think about the bombshells, not about the icy waters, but about the border, about the hot desert of the southern border. And President Trump's proposed tactics for slowing down migrants attempting to cross the border. The most shocking being his proposal to shoot migrants in the legs to slow them down. Now, this was first reported by the New York Times, but Fox News confirmed some of it with an illustration of alligators. The Washington Post and other news outlets have also confirmed this reporting, which all came from the book Border Wars, Inside Trump's Assault on Immigration. The book comes out on Tuesday. It's co-authored by New York Times reporters Julie Davis and Michael Shear, and Michael's joining me now from Washington. So, Michael, let's start with the book. What's the biggest revelation in the book? Well, look, I think the, the ones you put on the screen are probably the most sensational, but I think the, the, most, uh, uh, the, the bigger picture that we reveal in the book is the really extreme ways that, that we all didn't know, as your iceberg analogy suggests. We, we don't realize all of the different ways that the president um, and his, some of his top advisors, like Stephen Miller, the architect of his immigration agenda, were scheming and, and, and talking about, um, you know, even as, even as uh, you know, kind of we were all oblivious to it, and the ways in which the, many of the other people in the administration were pushing back, trying to stop the president from, uh, from pushing ahead. And, and what they repeatedly told Julie and I in the book, uh, for the book, is that he didn't come to these ideas once and then and then was talked out of them. He would he would bring an idea up. The the administration officials would say, "No, sir, you can't do that. Um, it's uh, it's not legal, or it's not moral, or it's not practical." And uh, and he would come back to it again and again and again. And and you know the fact is, look, we all think we know President Trump and what's going on because he's tweeting constantly and he's standing in front of the helicopter and talking endlessly. Uh, but the truth is, uh, despite that sort of illusion of of transparency, Transparency. There's a lot going on um, inside this administration that, that we don't know, and that's what we tried to do with the book. And oftentimes, authors are able to get at that for the first time. How did you and Julie get underneath the surface and see the rest of the iceberg? 
Well, look, both Julie and I have been covering immigration off and on in, in previous administrations for years. Um, but but there is something about writing a book where you can where you can say to a source, um, look, we would like to talk to you. We would like to get beneath the surface. We would like to understand a specific meeting, specific discussions that the president had, and we and we won't put them in the newspaper the next day. We, uh, this is a long process. We worked on the book for about a year and a half. Um, and, and you can tell people, you can tell sources, uh, you know, this won't appear um, in, in just in a single story. It'll be put in context in a broader, uh, uh, in, in the book in a broader way. And don't they, we need it, to know right away? Don't we need to know as soon as you know? Uh, well, look, there, that, that's, in, in an ideal world, as a journalist, I mean, I'm all about getting information out there. And, and in an ideal world, if somebody says to you, uh, here's a dramatic uh, piece of information and you can use it tomorrow, absolutely I would use it tomorrow. And we, uh, Julie and I, both pushed back on some of these uh, sources of ours to say, can we use this sooner? And in some cases we did. But look, you know, the truth is that this is, this is how you ferret information out. And when a, when a source tells you, look, I'm going to have this conversation with you, you only on condition that the information doesn't appear until the book, uh, you know, that's sort of where you have to do. Hmm. When your first excerpt came out in the New York Times, President Trump ranted about it. Here's part of what he said. Well, obviously it's fake because almost everything the Washington Post does is fake. Uh, okay, wait, what? So he kept going, he kept going, he kept ranting about the Washington Post. Obviously, you all work at the New York Times. What did you make of this mistake? I don't know. You know, there was some speculation that um, you know maybe he maybe he did it on purpose because he wanted to deny us publicity for uh, for who we actually are. <laughs> uh, if that's if that's the case, then I think it backfired because I, I suspect that we got more coverage uh, from people who were who had to then correct his mistake than than we would have if uh, if he had just uh, done it accurately. But it's also possible. Look, he he rants about the New York Times and the Washington Post kind of equally back and forth, and sometimes I, maybe he just got mixed up. Do you care, two and a half years in, do you care when he complains about your paper? I mean, sure. Look, it's, I covered eight years of the Obama administration. I cared every time uh, uh, the administration criticized our work. You, you want your work to be, um, uh, you know that your work is accurate and you don't want people to challenge it. Um, but the president's complaints about the accuracy of that story uh, were about as, as correct as his you know, assessment of where we worked. We are yep. fully confident uh, in the sources. We had multiple sources uh, describing these conversations to us for the book. And um, and look, I think as you as you pointed out, even Fox News and most other news organizations have have since confirmed it. So I think yep. you know, like like a lot of his other criticisms, I don't you know, I, they're just not they're just not right. They're noise. Uh, Michael, thank you very much. The book is unfit for office. Those are the words. The headline from this new piece by the husband of Trump aide Kellyanne Conway. This is George Conway writing for The Atlantic about President Trump's narcissism. It's something he's been worrying about for many months now, and he's getting more serious. He says, you don't need to be a mental health professional to see that something's very seriously off with Trump, particularly after nearly three years of watching his erratic and abnormal behavior. But before Conway, before all of us, there was Barbara Rest. She was a former a vice president of the Trump Organization and the construction engineer behind Trump Tower. Uh, she's also the author of All Alone on the 68th Floor, How One Woman Changed the Face of Construction. Uh, and Barbara joins me now. Uh, Barbara, I was wondering if you could help us unpack this week, this especially dramatic week. It, to me, I had never seen the president as angry as he was at a couple of these press avails yeah. this week. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll get into Conway in a minute, but had you seen that kind of anger before? Is this new to you, too? No, I've seen it before. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he was uh, always um, very quick to react, never, re never responded to anything, always reacted to it, and um, got very, very angry. He had this notion that everything that happened that was bad was directed at him, like they were after him, people were after him, even with the, with the, uh, the new thing with the uh, impeachment and the, uh, the, the whistleblower's letter. Immediately, he says, the whistleblower is, uh, he's a hack, he's a Democrat, he's, you know, he makes it like, not that they're after after something he might have done, the after him, and that's and that's the way he was. So that's a conspiracy, a conspiratorial streak. Anyway, yes. he's been there for decades. And yeah. you also wrote in the '80s about his narcissism. So <laughs> yeah. this is something that you noticed a long time ago. I did, but somebody um, uh, on the on the crew used to take the uh, train in from Connecticut. and He read the Times every day. So he brings in this article one day that has the definition of a narcissist, and we're all looking at it. And it's got like I don't know seven or eight things listed. And it's like it, it might have been a 
biography of Donald Trump or a profile of Donald Trump. Yeah, he was always like this. So in, in, in a way you're saying people should not be surprised. Absolutely. Do you think voters knew all of that, though, before they went to the polls? Two and a half years ago? I don't, years ago. No, I, I don't think anyone really knew uh, because people are constantly surprised. And, you know, I'm, I am surprised a little bit, too, with some of the things he does. But it's Why? Not, because you know, it's, it's worse or better? What, what, why are you surprised? Oh, I say it's worse. Mm -hmm. It's worse. Um, one of the things that surprised me was the comment about women's, uh, you know, uh, assaulting women. That I, I never ever heard him talk anything like that. So, you know, that kind of thing. Um, this, the, t telling the Russians that he didn't care about election meddling, that was a stupid thing to say. And I never thought of him as mm. stupid. So mm. that surprised me. But otherwise, no, this is Trump. Sometimes I say Trump squared because he's had, since I knew him, many, many years of fame and fortune and getting richer. And now he actually does believe he's a stable genius. And he does believe he can shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue. And so far, it looks like he can. And when Kellyanne Conway's husband says he's unfit for office, do, do you agree with that assessment? I do, yes. But I thought that when he was running. And not, not for necessarily the mental reasons that they talk about, but because he didn't have the experience. He, you know, lots of different things. So how do you see this ending now? Does it end at the ballot box in a year? Does he make it to a second term? Does he resign as a result of impeachment? What do you think? You know, it's funny. I, p people ask me that, and I'm thinking, you know, it's hard to say my opinion on national TV because I could very well be wrong. But let me, let me tell you what I thought. I mean, I think that he does a lot of things to save face. And, and I could give you examples, but we don't have time. But I mean, there are some things that, you know, he can't control. And he's now at the point where he can't control this. He can't do anything about this. Mm. Um, it would be very, very, very bad for him to be impeached. Impeached. I don't know that he'd be found guilty, but I don't think he wants to be impeached. I think, he, I think that's what this panic is about. And my gut tells me he'll leave office, he'll resign, or make some kind of a deal even, depending on what comes out. All right, there's the prediction. It's always is uh, nervous to do that on TV, but you know him. You've been there. <laughs> yeah, Barbara, bit. thank you. My pleasure. Thank see. you. Quick break here on the show, and then we continue our conversation about the impeachment inquiry. If you've noticed the recent tweets from the president, fake news is out, corrupt media is in. Why is he changing Trump's persistent attacks on the press have been building for, for a moment like this, discrediting the media in order to distract from real scandal? Now, if you noticed his Twitter feed lately, and how could you not, he's moved from calling the media just fake and crazy to a new term. He's moving to a word corrupt. He's been using this word a lot more this year, and especially in the past couple of months including in person. Corrupt media. Corruption. Corrupt. Corrupt. Pure corruption. Corrupt reporting. I'm only interested in corruption. I don't even use fake anymore. I call the fake news now corrupt news because fake isn't tough enough. So as the press uncovers evidence of corruption, he calls the press corrupt. It's the schoolyard taunt thing, you know, I know you are, but what am I on the presidential stage? Uh, with me now to talk about uh, the press coverage of the impeachment inquiry is former RNC communications director and Republican strategist Doug High and co-host of Signal Boost on Sirius XM and Share Blue editor Jess McIntosh. Thank you both. I want to get a left and right perspective to, to assess how the press is covering this probe. Uh, Jess, first to you, what's the most important point to make? Well, I, I think that it cannot be overstated how important the role the press has in the impeachment inquiry. This is run up to the Iraq war level big for the media. And I'm glad that it's happening after the media has had a year and change of covering him, of figuring out how to cover the fact that like the president's comments, which are newsworthy because he is the president, are often straight up lies. So we need more bold chirons, we need more real time fact checking, we need interviewers who are not afraid to hold these guys accountable. If you're going to have them on the air, you cannot allow them to get away with lying to your audience. We're seeing a lot of that. We're going to need more. Doug, is she right? Yeah, I, I think so. And I go. I always go back to what CNN's mo uh, motto is, which is facts first. And that's what has to take us to wherever this destination is that we're going to go. That's important for the press. That's important, should be re important for Trump, the administration, and Republicans. Also important for Democrats. You know, having worked in the House of Representatives during the Clinton impeachment, we went too far. We had a let's get them attitude. And the Democrats can't have that. So when Adam Schiff reads parodies, or says that he didn't talk to the whistleblower, but you know, he really did. That's a problem for Democrats. They need to take this very seriously and not get caught in, in the game that Trump wants to take us to all the time when he says, these are not the droids you're looking for. Did he 
talk to the whistleblower or did his office talk to the well, whistleblower? Well, he, he, he was very he was very specific with his language to make to give a really false impression of what happened. We know that they talked to it, but he said I didn't. The reality is they did, and and that's the kind of thing that Democrats can't afford to have happen because it allows Trump to cast again. These are not the droids you're looking for on everything that Democrats are doing. Jess, I don't see the both sidesism at play here. We have mm -hmm. a president who is actively gaslighting the country using our institutions like state and Department of Justice to advance his own political interests at our expense. I just don't see, with all due respect, the parallel between that and whatever no, tactics. No, no, I get it. Look, Trump is gaslighting. There's yes. no doubt about that. You know, he's using extreme rhetoric. Republicans are backing him up by and large every step of the way. That's a problem. I'm saying politically for Democrats and for the media, you can't afford to get it wrong here. This is mm -hmm. so serious that, you know, whenever there's a story that comes out in the media that a week later gets um, gets not only corrected but retracted or things like that, that allows Donald Trump to say this is all fake, this is all corrupt, and that's what Democrats politically and the media can't afford. Yeah, I don't think he's acting in good faith when he says, if one of you makes a mistake, all of you are bad. He's but he is saying it. It's true. He does say it, and we do have to be very, very careful. We also can't be cheerleading for an outcome here. Mm -hmm. No one knows how this is going to end. We just need to be able to carefully report on it. An interesting note about what CNN did this week. Trump's been running a few ads, his campaign's been running a few ads that have completely misleading claims about Biden. CNN chose not to run two of those ads, meaning rejected the money, said, no, we're not going to take your money and run those ads. I wonder if we're going to see more of that in the weeks to come. And another note, the Joe Biden campaign is pressuring the networks not to put Rudy Giuliani on the air at all, or if they do book Rudy, to put on a surrogate afterwards. What do you make of that, Doug? Well, you know, a lot of Democrats have told me, I, I don't know how you feel about this, put Rudy on all day, every day. You know, every, I'm kind of in that camp. Every day, <laughs> every day I see Rudy doing an interview. I know he did another one this morning. It's kind of a what planet is he on? And as a New York Yankees fan and as an American, I'm glad when he's at the Yankees game because that's four hours where he's not going on TV and spewing out whatever he's going to talk about. But should campaigns, in this case the Biden campaign, be telling networks or at least uh, pressuring networks not to book someone? Well, I, I think if you're going to have somebody on your air who you know is going to lie about your candidate, and that mm. is exactly what Rudy Giuliani does to Joe Biden every time he comes on air, I, as the campaign manager for Joe Biden, would be very interested in making sure that someone was on air to refute him immediately afterwards. Mm. That doesn't seem like a, a bridge too far to me at all. And notably, CNN did try to book Rudy today, mm. and he declined. <laughs> all right, uh, to the panel, thank you. Quick break here, and then we got a really interesting perspective from Iowa. Uh, looking at how uh, uh, folks in the Midwest, conservative voters who are watching Fox, how are they reacting to all these headlines about Trump's presidential and possibly illegal conduct? That's next. <laughs> D.C. and New York desperately need to hear from voters all across the country, and, and I include myself in that. So let's get out to Robert Leonard. He is something of a translator for Trump supporters and for rural America. He's the news director for two local radio stations in Iowa, KNIA and KRLS. And he occasionally writes op-eds for the New York Times, sharing what he's hearing and reporting on the ground. He's been doing that uh, for the New York Times and elsewhere since Trump was elected. He's also the author of a new book. Uh, it is titled Deep Midwest, a apolitical, thoroughly journalistic deep dive into the Midwest experience. So, Robert, I would love to know what you are hearing from your neighbors and your voters about the impeachment inquiry. Well, the Democrats smell blood in the water, and they're very excited. A lot of them are happy the trigger was finally uh, pulled because Trump has done a lot of things in their mind that are uh, impeachable. Some of the independents are moving away from Trump, especially people that actually voted for Obama twice, then Trump. But most of the conservative, conservatives I know, especially the evangelical religious right conservatives, are standing strong behind President Trump because he is a kind of a golden hammer that's what's needed to break what they see as the liberal stranglehold on our society that's dismantling America as they see it brick by brick. And that's the reality on the ground that is oftentimes missed, I think, even when you have conservative commentators on cable news talking about these things. Even the Hannity's of the world don't fully relate to that. Let me show you what you wrote a couple of years ago for the New York Times. The headline back then was, if you want to uh, oust Trump, if you want to get rid of Trump, only Fox News can do it. Is that true two years later? Yes, it's true. It's absolutely true. Uh, but I've got to be more specific this time. Fox News has turned, it's a very different beast 
than it was a couple of years ago when I wrote that. Now they're starting to point out some of the problems uh, with President Trump's behavior, his actions. Fox opinion, however, hasn't. And even Tucker Carlson's little sidestep uh, the other day didn't really mean anything because most of us don't see Fox News per se. We see Fox opinion. It's Fox and friends in the morning. It's Tucker and Sean at night. By the time we have uh, the kids, grandkids put to bed, sit down after supper, it's all opinion. And so Fox opinion would have to change big and I don't see that happening unless we see something truly egregious uh, that would move my Republican friends, but it's going to take a lot. They really think that the personal qualities, his, his willingness to break all rules and expectations of the presidency are, are what is needed. No other Republican could have done what he's done for the evangelical right, the Republican right, that he's done. Everybody else would have been too conventional. He's a, he's a kind of hero still. So 20 seconds left. As we cover all of this in the weeks to come, what's the one thing we've got to remember uh, in the cable news coverage? Well, uh, speak to conservatives. Hear what they have to say. Uh, one of the things that also some of your earliest panelists said in this program is keep speaking the truth, trying to reach more voters. Uh, just keep working. The thing, the, what's ultimately going to solve this current problem, I think, and what's going to, our only solution uh, is the truth, and that's the truth mm. that will win uh, at the end.